morning. Can you hear me okay? Okay, that means I did properly hit the mute button on my mic then, so that's, that's good. I couldn't see it, it's too far back here, so. My name is Roger Burke. I uh, live here in Linden, have lived here for 20 years. I'm married, have three children. Uh, we came up here, my wife and I and our two children at the time came up here from Tucson, Arizona so that I could attend Regent College. That was 20 years ago. And uh, I continue to uh, work at Praise 1065 where I kind of almost started as soon as we got here. And uh, if you listen to that radio station, uh, you might recognize my voice from a number of commercials that I do. I sell advertising, I write and produce ads. And that's how I keep food on the table. And I have been asked to preach here again. I'm honored. It was uh, 2017, uh, two years ago that I was here last. So I don't know if you uh, were here then, but uh, I do have a different sermon this time. <laughs> this morning, in fact, I want to read out of Genesis 41, verses 51 and 52. Uh, I was uh, going through the book of Genesis with my daughter, and we were kind of talking about it. Uh, just going through chapters and having discussions. And I found this particular couple of verses very interesting, just as way of uh, background. Um, in the ancient Near East, when this was written, names actually had meanings. There are, there are places in the world today where names still have meanings. And these are like real legitimate meanings. The meanings of the names that Joseph gives his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, are very telling. What he calls them, what he names his kids, is so important to understanding the way Joseph encountered trials, because he went through some doozies. So here's what you're going to hear from me today. As servants of God, number one, our suffering has purpose. As servants of God, Number one, our suffering has purpose. Number two, we get a tailwind. We get pushed from behind in loving others. And number three, we point others to Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this morning and for the opportunity to see something else about you and your majesty. Help us to be attuned to your spirit and your word right now. Help our hearts to be tenderized by it and for it to speak into us as much as we read your word, Lord. Let your word read us this morning and reveal to us the wonder of your love for us. Reveal the need that we have within our hearts for more of you and the charge that we've been given be there for others. We pray in your name. Amen. So Joseph's dreams. You know Joseph, if you're not familiar with the story of Joseph, Joseph was one of 12 brothers, and all of them were older than him, and he was yet his father's favorite. He was Jacob's favorite son. Now, if you're an older brother and you know your younger brother is the favorite, that doesn't necessarily set him off in your mind as a great guy. You feel a little bit passed over. And those older brothers felt passed over, especially in light of Joseph's dreams. Joseph has a couple of pretty interesting dreams. And they, he feels the need to tell his brothers these dreams. In fact, he tells both his brother and his father these dreams. The first time, the first dream, is his brothers are seen bowing down to him. If you remember, it's the dream of the sheep, And these are sheep of wheat, very agrarian, agricultural area. So metaphors were agrarian or agricultural in nature. So it's sheep of wheat. His brothers are metaphorically these these big uh, bound, uh, bound uh, pieces of wheat, and they are bowing down to him. He tells them this dream. Hey, I saw in my dream you guys bowing down to me. In his second dream, his own father bows down to him. 
Some believe 17 year old Joseph was foolish to tell his family these dreams. And to be sure, Joseph has a gift for dream interpretation. And the dreams in this story all come true, interestingly. Every one of Joseph's dreams actually come true. They are prophetic dreams. So maybe he knew the dreams wouldn't go over well, but he told them anyways. He told his brothers and his father anyways, kind of speaking truth to love. <laughs> And you know, words of truth need to be spoken many times. Words of truth, even those spoken in love, are often misunderstood. I'm sure you've had this experience in your own lives. You try to help somebody out. You try to tell them something that needs to be told, and they take offense to it. In this story, twice, Joseph's love for his brothers and, and family is completely misunderstood. You're not alone completely misunderstood. And uh, so, yeah, actually, Joseph knows, and this is part of why I suggest it's a possibility that Joseph wasn't just being this juvenile goofball to tell his, his family that he had these dreams. Uh, it's true that he knows interpretations are God's and that they belong to him, to the cupbearer and baker later in the story. He says, don't interpretations belong to God? To Pharaoh itself, himself, he says, it is not me. God will interpret. God will give Pharaoh a favorite, favorable answer. So Joseph has this understanding that he's got a gift and that this gift of dream interpretation is real. So the key to this sermon, the key to this whole message today is that Joseph realizes eventually that his suffering helps others. And my hope is that the Joseph story helps us interpret our suffering. So we can see Joseph's understanding of his own, and by doing so, I hope we can actually overlay our own suffering and recognize that we too have good reason to take heart that all that we go through on behalf of God and on behalf of others is redemptive. So, what do we know about holy suffering? We know this. We are always in His hands. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. My wife and I go from time to time up to a, a live theater in Vancouver, British Columbia, called Pacific Theater. It's in the basement of an Anglican church. It's theater in the round. It's very intimate. And the presentations that they put on there are super amazingly cutting edge, great, beautifully written, expertly acted, very powerful. You leave the theater changed. Uh, I don't know if any of you like live theater, but it, I, it's not like we go to these types of things a lot, but. It's always powerful. So this particular play was called Espresso, uh, like the drink Espresso. But it was not about coffee. It was about a terrible tragedy in the life of this woman. She uh, was bereaved by um, a, an accident, a car accident in the story. And as she is just venting in her catharsis moment of total destruction from losing this loved one. She is, um, this, this, the writing spares no uh, graphic detail. She is just letting loose with a litany of profanity and <coughs> curses to God. And during this, you're just shocked as an audience member thinking, oh my goodness, this woman is, she is wrecked. But in the process, you as the viewer get to see this image come behind her and hug her from behind. This is the person of Christ in the story. So here she is blaspheming God, calling out curses to God, and yet he is embracing her. And it's such a poignant moment in the play because you realize that at the moment when we feel the furthest away from God, there he is embracing us. 
I, I think the play kind of wrecked me in a way, you know, a great way, you know, the best possible way, because I can't forget it. I can't forget that image. We never leave God's grace. In your personal trial, it's super easy to miss that He is right there with you, providing, sustaining, encouraging. Right? You agree with that? It's so easy to miss this. So, there are so many ways we can feel unfairly treated. And I'm just going to throw out a few of them there uh, so that maybe you can find some resonance here. Sickness. Sickness is terrible. Someone you love dies. Loneliness. Disease. Loss of work. Betrayal. Abuse. Divorce. You can be angry, hurt, demoralized, ashamed. All of these things can exist inside of us at any given moment, and they come in couples sometimes. Nevertheless, He is there with you right now. Nothing can separate us from the love of the Lord. Do you have a divine dream, like Joseph, to help others? It is to help others trust Christ, to alleviate suffering, to bring peace, clarity, freedom, to love the unlovable, to lift another's burden. This is all, any and all of these require sacrifice. And sacrifice equals suffering. And undertaken in Christ's name, your suffering is justified. You know, the, the story of Joseph and his brother, sorry, his, uh, his sons, is a great one from the standpoint that it's in the midst of his suffering, Joseph's suffering, that he names his kids these beautiful names. Let me uh, read those to you, and um, I will tell you why I think these are so powerful. So it says in verse 52, uh, sorry, verse 51, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim, and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So this is Joseph's post-trial life. His reflection on the 20 years of suffering he just endured. Let's keep in mind what happened to Joseph. Joseph is thrown into a pit. They first, his brothers at first imagined they were just going to kill him. Let's just kill him. Joseph is sent by his dad out to find his brothers. He finally finds them. It's like this 50-mile journey on two feet. He's walking these enormous amounts of miles. He finds them. They see him. They seize him and say, let's kill him. The oldest brother says, let's not kill him. Let's throw him into a pit. And they do so. And then some, some traders are going by in their caravan. And someone comes up with the idea, let's sell him to these Ishmaelite traders. So they sell Joseph. Joseph is sold. And in the process of going to this new kind of owner, if you will, he is later promoted. He comes up from Potiphar's household. We you know these stories well. Um, he is falsely accused. He essentially, he is put in prison. And uh, it's in prison that God does amazing things. It's not because you know, Joseph, somehow there's a big speed bump in Joseph's life and all of a sudden God can no longer be operative. This speed bump is every bit as much a part of God's plan for Joseph as the promotion. Um, even the time when he was being afflicted by his brothers was part of God's plan. None of this escapes God's sovereign plan. But then Joseph comes up and is promoted and essentially becomes the right hand man of Pharaoh. Functionally, he's the most powerful person in all of Egypt. He goes from being thrown in a pit to being this promoted um, authority in all of Egypt and is instrumental, as we know, in alleviating so much suffering because he has a plan for the famine. He has another dream interpretation. So it's easy in our personal trial to miss that he is with us right when we need him and uh, when we feel the least likely to have any God in our lives. So, I'm going to say that 
Joseph's example and the way he names his sons, the things he names his sons, lead us to understand that you can and I can encounter suffering in a way that takes on a completely different light. That he names Manasseh what he does. That he, he says of Manasseh that God made him forget all his trouble. This is not amnesia. Joseph didn't forget trouble because he, had, he was forgetful. We forget trouble when we recognize that it was redemptive. We re-understand, we re purpose it in our minds. We find a way to redeem that difficulty, that suffering, because it was on behalf of someone else. So God's, Joseph's dream to bring about redemption is his partnership with God. Paul in the New Testament says, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. God's providence is amazing. And Christ followers are called to cooperate in the life-giving message of God's grace and forgiveness. So point one is that as servants of God, our suffering has purpose. And that is the key to uh, understanding suffering in every Christian's life. We, our lives are essentially a praise offering. Romans 12.1 says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You know, I think in the story of Joseph, we see hardship and we see abundance. And our tendency is to say, God is with Joseph in the abundance. He's somehow absent in the hardship. But I believe that both of these are springboards for God's glory. He shapes a larger outcome using you in the process. Whether it's in abundance or in hardship, God is in control. There was an author years ago, who was very popular years ago, in the 80s and 70s. His name was Larry Crabb. And Larry wrote a great book called Inside Out. I've only read this one book from Larry Crabb, but boy, I loved it. In this book, I came away with this great quote. Now, try not to plunge too deeply into depression as I read this quote to you because it is pretty dark. But it simply says this, there is something wrong with everything. How's that for a ray of sunshine? <laughs> There is something wrong with everything. Put this to the test if you don't believe it. There really is something wrong with everything beside that. And as you and I live life, that fact is portrayed in reality to us more and more every day. There is something wrong with everything. We have other ways of saying it. There's always a snake in the grass. You know, we, we have different ways of understanding this truth. But it is true, and I feel like the more we uh, recognize that, the more we can lower our expectations for what we should reasonably expect from life. Life is going to be difficult. It's going to be full of difficulties. And yet we can have this unique perspective that Joseph I love what Psalm 41 through 3 says. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of my mitery bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Nothing can separate us. We are safe in His hands. I'm a cyclist, so I like to go out and ride my bike. I like to ride on the road. I like to ride on the trails. There's gobs of great riding uh, here in Watkins County. And uh, I've ridden for a number of years. I've been fortunate not to have crashed many times until two years ago in October when uh, I was out for a ride and uh, I actually, it was dark. Um, I ride with the light. You're thinking already, well, idiot, why are you riding in the dark? Um, you know, at that time of year, October, it's, it's pretty dark in the morning, even 
at 6 a.m. It started and thinking, well, I need to get, I want to get my ride in before work, so I'm going to ride in the dark. I have lights, front and rear, I'm safe. So I go out and I see another bike light coming at me, and um, it's my friend uh, Mason. And I join up with Mason, and we ride together for a little while. Well, Mason and I go down Wide Camp Road, and uh, he hits a pothole that he does not see because it's dark. And um, that pothole instantly deflates his front tire. Like in a second, it's flat. We're going 21 miles an hour. I know that because uh, I was recording the activity on my phone and it stopped right at 21 miles an hour. So he uh, is incapable of steering and, and, and glides into me and we both go into the ditch. Now, as he hits me, I realize we're done. We're going into the ditch. You may as well just surrender it now. Just live with the fact that you're going down at full speed and this is going to hurt. So it almost like time goes into slow motion in these types of moments because I see the ditch and I see basically where we're going to land. And the inevitability of it all, I just decided to close my eyes. I'm not going to see anything that I want to see anyways. <laughs> Nothing coming my way in the next split second is going to encourage me. So I just closed my eyes, and in that second, I, I felt like I'm going to be okay. I'm just going to, I don't, I'm not trying to say I did anything holy or great or you know, uh, virtuous here. I just automatically said, Lord, I am in your hands. I'm just committing my spirit to you right now. And so closing my eyes, I don't know why we, um, it seems, I don't know if we actually went, if I was unconscious or not, but all I know is uh, I felt like the Lord took me he was like with me in the midst of that crash. I felt safe in his hands somehow, and I shouldn't have, but I did. And I feel like this is how we can crash in life. We can crash in certain areas, certain times, and we do this repeatedly uh, in ways that accept that he has us in his hands. Um, if that story is any encouragement to you, just let it, you know, kind of overlay into your context in such a way where in the midst of your, you know, fall to the ditch uh, in the darkness that you know is going to hurt, just recognize that He is with you. He is with you. He's going down into that ditch with you. And that's encouragement to us as believers because it says in, in so many places throughout Scripture, very famously in the psalm, uh, I, I, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there you are with me. He doesn't wait for us on the other side. He goes through it with us. We are safe in His hands. My second point today is that we experience a bit of a push from behind when we are involved in the assistance of other people. This is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is operative in our lives. Uh, again, another bike analogy. Yesterday, my wife and I were riding, and uh, it was a bit, a bit of a windy day. I said to her, wow, you can tell we have a tailwind right now. She said, I don't I feel no wind whatsoever. Well, no, you don't. But that's because it's from behind us. It's equaling itself with us. We're equal to it. So we don't feel any wind. Consequently, we're cruising. We're moving without much effort. Turn around and go the other direction. Completely different story. When we are being enlisted on behalf of another person, and we do this in Christ's name, the Holy Spirit pushes us from behind. We actually receive assistance. We get help from God to do the things that we are to do for Him in His name. Not do, do I, am I insinuating that that makes it um, easy? Heavens no. Never is it easy. It is always hard. It is always a sacrifice. But the Holy Spirit does assist us. There is help. We do, like my wife didn't know we had been from behind, but we did. You may not recognize it, but it's there because we do it in the Spirit of Christ and we do it with His empowerment. You know, the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. We get the word pneumatic from it. We get many other words from pneuma. 
Pneuma literally translated means spirit, wind, breath. It has like 16 other meanings, actually. It's a very dynamic word. But wind and breath, spirit, is there for us. It's there for us. You get a tailwind in helping others. And you know, we are freed to love generously because God's been so generous to us. He's been generous in grace, forgiveness and love, restoration and redemption. He's been patient with your fears and sinful ways and your neediness. His posture toward you and me is generous because that's his character. We know the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faith this morning. His faithful response to our daily needs is restorative. His love toward us, towards us, provides an example of the love we can have toward others. You know, God showed us favor when we didn't deserve it, and now we get to do the same. You ever meet someone that doesn't deserve to be loved, and yet you love them anyway? So that's some of the hardest loving to do. They don't deserve it. They didn't apologize, but I'm going to show forgiveness anyways. You know, my wife has a, a favorite saying, people snares can take you down. People <laughs> snares, the traps we fall into with others. People can be so rude, they can be so unkind, they can be so unaware of the love and mercy and care and kindness that you show them. It is sometimes so discouraging. But yet, those are the kinds of people that God loved, because we're, the, we're that kind of people in truth. God showed us favor when we didn't deserve it. Since we've been shown such love, expressing kindness to others is the natural way to demonstrate gratitude to God. So the Holy Spirit, I suggest, provides a push from behind, helping us partner in His redemptive work. My final point, point three, is that when we commit ourselves to God, there's a certain certain leadership that we have. And what I mean to say is that we get to point others to Christ. You know, as administrator over Egypt, Joseph answers only to Pharaoh, but he uses his power to serve. Likewise, our authority is our opportunity to serve. You know, the incarnation, big word, is the ultimate example of greatness emptying out for others. We read in 1 John, in John rather, John the Gospel, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's God becoming man. Incarnation comes from the word carne, flesh. God becomes flesh. God becomes man. God, in His holiness, comes down and dwells with us in this place. That is the incarnation. And since the incarnation, there is no job too small for believers. No job too small. We do this through other. The second greatest commandment is to love others and ourselves. We're commanded to this. So when we permit God to do this, to use us, we allow the needs of others to go on par with our own. In these and many other ways, we point others to Christ. So here's the summary of the three points I've made. When we permit God to use us, we see our suffering has a purpose, that we have a tailwind of loving others, and that our lives point others to Christ. Here's the shocking thing about this Joseph story. After his entire family has been fed, comforted, forgiven, and restored, we watch the older brothers mistake Joseph's love for something altogether different. It says in 15, verses 15 through 17 of chapter 50, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a messenger to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Why did he weep? He wept because they missed 
all the grace, all the love and forgiveness that He had already bestowed upon them. Without this invented apology, without this invented idea that Joseph's dad said these things, none of that was true. But his brothers missed it. They missed grace. You know, we're more like Joseph's older brothers than we are like Joseph. Just want you to hear that for a minute. We are more like Joseph's older brothers than we are like Joseph. I would have helped throw Joseph into that pit. I have pride. I resent failures. I don't like being told I'm nothing. I distance myself from people who make me feel less. What about you? That's what Joseph's brothers did. They reject his love and forgiveness, thinking it can't be real because they did nothing to earn it. I'm a lot like the brothers in my struggle to understand the loving kindness of Jesus. I've been adopted, forgiven, and restored. He pledges his love to me, and yet I still dismiss the possibility his love is big enough to atone for my humanity. I spurn Christ the same way Joseph's brothers spurned Joseph. The struggle with grace is real. What about you? Let the response of Joseph's brothers remind us today that we miss God's kindness principally because it isn't deserved. It isn't justified. Joseph's brothers did not deserve kindness, but they received loads of it from Joseph. This is yet another story of grace. But Jesus is the better Joseph. For just as Joseph suffered to save the lives of unbelieving <coughs> brothers out of love, so too Christ bids us to dine with him, to come and eat our fill at his table. He loves that you and me, who, despite our ignorance, are his adopted children seated at his table. To make this possible, Jesus suffered at the hands of the very people he came to save. He too was rejected, betrayed, sold, falsely accused, and in ultimate despair separated from his father. And he suffered all of this to save the family he loves. We begin creating a better reality for others the second we step off our path for them. Let me be very practical. This isn't just ideology. When you step off your path, the path you are on, the path to your destination, to where you are going, to what you are doing, to what you want, the second you step one half inch off of that path on someone else's behalf, you are now sacrificing, not in some huge way maybe, it could be a super small sacrifice, but you are surrendering your agenda for someone else. What might that look like? It could be you showing hospitality, inviting someone over for coffee or a meal. It could be you simply allowing yourself to listen to someone, to mentor, to speak truth, to pray for, to return kindness for evil, to forgive, to apologize to invest, to become present. I'll argue your marriage is one ongoing stepping off of your path for the other, and it's a beautiful, holy surrender. I will argue that parenthood is a continual stepping off of your path on behalf of the other, and it too is a holy surrender. Anytime we do something, for somebody else that makes us deviate so ever so slightly, it is surrender. Do not minimize that. Celebrate that. Be intentional about that. Recognize that that is done unto the Lord, and it is done unto the Lord because He has lavished so abundantly into your life and mine. In conclusion, Christ followers are the hands and feet of Jesus. We don't have to go anywhere exotic for God to use us. God used Joseph everywhere he went, even in prison. 
He is using you right now where you are. He's not waiting to use you where you're going to be in the future. He's using you now. The story of Joseph reminds us that all of our hardship can be forgotten in the light of redemption. That we can be fruitful in our land of affliction. Let these words propel you forward. 